Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And now I pray that I may speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? So uh, last Sunday morning at 10.15, uh, we sang the old song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And uh, I think that has rather shaped my thoughts as we come this week to Transfiguration Sunday. So I want to talk a bit about friendship. I wonder what it was like for Peter and the other disciples to have Jesus as a friend. We know that there was a lot of time talking, walking, eating together. There were times when Jesus slept in the boat as Peter and the other fishermen got Jesus safely across to the other side. There were moments of great excitement, healings, miracles, moments like the transfiguration when just Jesus, Jesus's closest friends, Peter, James and John, went up the mountain with him. And there they saw a glimpse of Jesus' true identity, the dazzling, unearthly beauty of a figure that seemed so much more than the man that they'd been travelling with. And it's one of those moments that, uh, in a Facebook age, uh, I guess if uh, James and John had had their phones, they probably would have wanted to capture it on video, because it's one of those moments when Peter gets things wrong. There are other moments when he gets things wrong, but this is definitely one of them. He, we'd had, he'd had another one, a sort of foot-in-mouth moment a few verses earlier in Mark's Gospel, when he tried to prevent his friend Jesus from embarking on a course of suffering. Peter knows that in Jesus there is something hugely special and significant. You're the Messiah. But when Jesus starts to talk about suffering, Peter's like, no, 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 no. We're not having any of that. That's not going to be in the plan. Get behind me, Satan, was Jesus' uncompromising reply. Clearly, when we're talking about the relationship between Jesus and his disciples, the, the relationship wasn't completely equal. The power in the relationship rested more with Jesus as the Son of God, although that power was used in a very subversive way, washing his friend's feet. But Jesus, in uh, John's Gospel, in that long discourse before the night of the, cru before the, night of, uh, before the crucifixion, says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. So looking at it, the marks of friendship 
this particular friendship seems to be this. It was a very deep friendship. A friendship where you can share your views on life and death and everything in between. It's a friendship which involves training, sort of uh, apprenticeship, but, but more than that. Because Jesus was training Peter and the others to see life differently, forming their priorities and giving them lessons that would take them forward when he was no longer with them. And it's a friendship which wasn't afraid to challenge. There's a, a huge honesty, but also a challenge when things weren't right. Now I am sure, absolutely sure, that Peter loved it when Jesus gave him the nickname Rocky and told everyone that Peter would be the foundation stone of the church community. But we also see Jesus pointing things out to Peter that aren't right. And as I've said, that rebuke, get, me behind, get behind me, Satan, not quite so warm and comforting, is it, as, uh, as a nickname from Jesus? But Jesus had to train his friends to understand that the mission that Jesus was on would lead to death. And here at the Transfiguration, confronted with this amazing sight of Jesus shining in glory, Peter blurts something out about making shelters. Not quite sure, but I do wonder whether he hoped that uh, perhaps he hadn't learnt his lesson in the rebuke from Jesus. Perhaps he hoped that he could keep Jesus safely up the mountain, away from any talk of suffering. This is more what the Messiah should look like. Dazzling white. This is going to be a sight to see. Perhaps he thought he'd bring others up the mountain, maybe run little tours. Come and have a look at the shining figure. This is the Messiah. This is who it's all about. But we know as I think Peter knew, but didn't quite fully take on board, that Jesus' mission was always about getting his hands dirty, about giving his life to others until there was nothing left to give. Jesus was never, ever going to stay up the mountain. And in his relationship with Peter and the others, he talked and shared and corrected and forgave them, and the relationship could hold all of that. And even then, after what Peter had seen and, and known and shared, Peter would deny Jesus when the chips were down, around a fire in the early morning light as the cock crowed. Peter let his friend down. But Jesus didn't give up, and the relationships that he forged with the disciples survived the heartbreak and death and found new depth and new life in the resurrection hope and the resurrection relationship. So thinking about that and with those words from uh, that wonderful song, what a friend we have in Jesus, still being the earworm of this week, I think. It hasn't quite left my head all week. Because we do hope to find a faithful friend in Jesus, a friend who sees us and knows us and never gives up on us, a friend who will help shape our priorities and call us to more. A friend who will never give up on us, even in the moments when we turn our backs or let him down or deny him in some way. Which is a friendship which is rare in an age of superficial friendships like Facebook acquaintances and Twitter followers or ex-followers or whatever they are now. This is a different kind of relationship. And I think that probably as Christians, in our searching for God, we have to get to know Jesus and allow Jesus to know us, which will happen through prayer and worship and Bible study. But it also happens in the friendships and relationships with the people around us. Some of those will be superficial friendships. Some of those will be relationships that rub us up the wrong way and knock the corners off us slightly. But we also, I think, all need to find the people who will walk with us in honesty, encourage us, pick us up when we're down, challenge us. 
Churches need to be places where friendships grow, but friendships also allow others in. We're never called to be a closed clique, but travelling companions, companions, those who share bread together as we will tonight. There's always room for more round the table and we have to be open and warm to allow people to come in and to get to know us and find that we're not perfect, but that we are following in the way of the one who loves us. Jesus had a way of drawing people to the table. And I'm sure people, Peter found himself eating alongside not just fishermen and family, but prostitutes and tax collectors and an assortment of all kinds of people. And that challenge to see the world differently that was forged in the friendships of Jesus with his closest friends would continue as the early church battled its way through rules and regulations, trying not to lose sight of Jesus, who came to break down barriers between Jews and Gentiles, between men and women, between slaves and free. And in church today, and I kind of mean the national church here, we struggle again through all kinds of rules and expectations and arguments bogged down at the moment with arguments about sexuality that threaten to overwhelm the institution and drive people away. But Jesus called us to relationship with him and one another and called us to seek him in a relationship and relationships that give and receive, that forgive and love and relationships that go deeply and honestly. And it's in the ordinariness of those relationships and the messiness of them, that again we glimpse something bigger than ourselves, the transfigured Jesus who shines brighter than the most dazzling washing powder, that shines with love of God and God in action. One of the songs in our songbook that we sometimes sing, um, I can't remember what the first verse is because I've only put the last two down, but it has these lovely words which I think talk of friendship and pilgrimage and faithfulness and trust. God asks who will go for me, who will extend my reach, and who, when few will listen, will prophesy and preach, and who, when few bid welcome, will offer all they know, and who, when few dare follow, will walk the road I show. Amused in someone's kitchen, asleep in someone's boat, attuned to what the ancients exposed, proclaimed and wrote. A saviour without safety, a tradesman without tools, has come to tip the balance with fishermen and fools. Amen. And as we move to a time of prayer, let us focus our thoughts by singing together. Jesus. 
as we look at the events in our world, and so many of them are troubled. Help us to hope and to see where you are at work, in our homes and in our daily lives. Help us to notice the glimpses of your glory shining through the ordinary fabric of our lives, our relationships, our friendships. Open our eyes to see more of you and to hope for more of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of glory, in a world that is so troubled, help us to make our churches places of sanctuary and peace and safety and friendship. May we be ready to respond to the needs of others and to do what we can to tell the story of the love that will never let us go, the love that can change us and transform the world. Help us to love one another as you have loved us. You are the God who comes close to us, though we are far apart from each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of glory, we pray for situations in the world that need hope and healing. In particular, we pray tonight for Israel, for Gaza and Ukraine. We ask for words and actions that are full of hope and not hate. For words and actions of forgiveness and unity rather than division. Please guide this and every nation in your ways of justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Loving God, we remember this evening people in our own community, people in our own families who are suffering, and ask that you would lighten the pain and distress of daily life. You are the God who knows us, the God who sustains us, so that we ask that you surround each of us and those we love with your healing grace and your overwhelming light. Almighty God, we ask you to show us something more of who you are, a glimpse of your amazing presence. Overcome our fear of the unknown and lead us into a new experience of you so that we are transformed and changed in our friendship with Jesus. And we gather our prayers together by singing. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, 